G'day everyone, welcome back to True Footy uh, here from Macclesfield, England today. I know I'm indulging a little bit in Eagles content, so this is the second Eagles video in the last handful of days, but got to strike all the irons hot, and uh, unfortunately, you know, the Eagles are obviously a topic across all the like, AFL media, that's the story this week, is how bad West Coast is, and uh, what they can possibly do to fix that, how arrogant we are, all that kind of stuff. We've just copped it in every way possible. And I get that. I, in fact, I'm doing it too. That's fair enough, but uh, even if I disagree with some of the small comments made along the way. So today, um, I have gotten myself a coffee, like a comically large coffee. I asked for a large coffee. This is a large coffee from Costa. Cost me $7. What a joke. And we're just going to hash out um, the, the way that I think the Eagles need to uh, proceed from this point in time. And, and like I said the other day in my review of the Sydney game, or at least my reaction to it, not so much a review, was that there's two kind of simultaneous conversations we've got to be having about how the Eagles get out of this hole, right? So there's the here and now, which is just as important as the end of the season. So what I'm talking about there is, yeah, the, the end of the season, the list strategy, uh, the list management moves, how we're going to get more draft picks and talent into the side is a, a big part of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but then there's also the other very real conversation of how did the Eagles stop the bleeding at this point of the season to mitigate any further damage to the brand. We're already an embarrassment, but at this point we can't rule out things getting worse because the injury list is getting worse, which is not to suggest that the injuries are the sole reason for why we are in the hole we're in, uh, but obviously more injuries, particularly to key players like Elliot Yo this week, uh, it's going to make it even harder to compete. So to, to reflect on you know how the game sort of went, the, the shit part about it is that the area of the ground which I think we got most exposed was through the midfield, and that is the part of the ground with through which we have the least injuries. In fact, that was almost our full strength midfield. You do take out Nick Nat Nui, um, obviously, and I know the people will say, well, he's been gone for ages, but still, I think what we've got is a midfield group that is talented on paper, but has always struggled with the contested um, side of the game and winning their own ball, in particular defensive pressure. And what I think's happened over the last decade is with the silver service from Nick Nat Nui, who's palming it to their advantage and allowing skillful players like Kelly and Shuey and Sheed. If he's giving them first looks, then our midfield has become so accustomed to that that they don't really know how to handle it uh, when you know we don't have a supreme ruckman um, tapping through their advantage, and I know that there is an exception at the back end of 2018, where you know the second half of the year Nick Nat was obviously out, and we suddenly became one of the best contested sides in the in the competition at the back end of that year, and that's been a massive outlier because we haven't been like that. Uh, even before or since then. So what we've got is a midfield group that, um, you know, obviously is aging for a start, but they're not really a, a midfield that is accustomed to contested ball and, and defense, defending on transition quickly. And that's the way the game's going, and that was the way we got most exposed against Sydney. Sure, the, the back line suffered under an avalanche that was all these inside 50s coming out really, really easily, and it was impossible for the backs, and then the forwards, you know, barely got a look at it at all. So that's the frustrating thing as well, is because, um, you know, in terms of fixing the problem here and now, I don't know how much we can do to fix that by the end of the year, and it gets worse when our best contested midfielder is out for another month. It wasn't just him. We lost uh, Petrovsky's seat, and we lost uh, Jack Williams from that game as well. So um, with Hearn and Cripps potentially coming in this week, again, we probably still have less players to pick from than we did last week. And this feels like an endless cycle now. So our hands are tied very much in terms of personnel sense. Uh, and, and that includes the coach as well. There's a lot of talk about Adam Simpson getting sacked. And since I made that point the other day about the financials being a factor, we've gotten a closer look at what it would actually cost the Eagles to move on their coach, Adam Simpson, right now. And the fact is they've backed him in. And that is largely due, you'd think, to the financial situation. So just to clarify, what you pay your coach comes under a football department spending cap. The idea is that uh, some of the richer clubs can't just spend more on coaches than some of the poorer clubs. So if Simpson is contracted for another two years, if we sack him now, we have to pay out that entire contract. That comes under the salary cap, which means that the cost of hiring a new coach, which you'd, you know, you'd want to be hiring a coach that is uh, a reasonable standard and therefore will have his own reasonable salary. It might not be, you know, Adam Simpson levels, but it will still be significant. That cost also hits the salary cap, which would mean the Eagles are likely to exceed that salary cap. And what it's come out with recently is that for every dollar after like $500,000 that you exceed the uh, the football department spending cap, there is a 200% tax. So rather than go through all the nitty gritty, it basically came out that the Eagles would lose about $7 million just to sack Adam Simpson. And you might look at that and say, well, the Eagles are an extremely profitable club. Yes, that, that is true. Uh, they're the richest club, the most profitable club. But it's still a brave man to have to make the decision to drop the $7 million off their
their bottom line. I remember seeing numbers recently that we were the most profitable club uh, a few years ago and our you know, net profit was something like $5 million. So it's a difference between a profit and a loss. And while we as football fans don't really care if our team or our club uh, goes into a loss in any given year, it's still you would still take a brave man to make that call, especially when we don't fully know if Adam Simpson is the wrong man to take over this club. So between now and the end of the year, what do the Eagles need to do? Well, they need to get the senior players to get their shit together. And you know, since that video that I made uh, talking about how the, the effort was poor, there's been so much footage all over um, AFL media about cl uh, clear examples of players missing tackles, some piss weak tackles, um, clearly not running after the ball. There's some damning footage where um, you know Noah Long and Tim Kelly are next to each other in the forward 50 and then about 30 seconds later you see Noah Long sprint the full length of the field to lay a tackle and Tim Kelly still basically back where he started and I can kind of understand how that happens Tim Kelly to I know I've just pinpointed one player who's had a great season he's busted his ass for most of this year can understand why the motivation for him to just keep running his ass off when the team is getting absolutely smashed would be different to Noah Long who is still trying to make his way in the AFL career so what we need to do is just instill some belief and confidence back into these players and they need to start trying harder. We need to give Tim Kelly a reason, or Tim Kelly or Andrew Gaff or Sam petrovsky seaton give them a reason to keep trying for four quarters. But anyway, my, my only real point there is there's only so much we can do in between now and the end of the season. We've got to grit our teeth and bear it and just hope that th there's no more embarrassing results. What we're going to talk about today more in depth is uh, what I would do from a list management point of view. There's a lot of talk about um, the Eagles are receiving criticism for everything right now. And, um, you know, that's justified. I'm not, uh, I'm not butthurt about that. But I do think what tends to happen is that there's this hyper focus on little things here and there that we've done, we've made mistakes about that is getting blown out of proportion. So a few examples of that would be the decision to sign Nick Natanui to a second year instead of just a one year deal last year. I mean, sure, I'm probably against giving players multiple year contracts when they're at the back end of their career and certainly in their third but is there any relevance to Nick Nat's contract to the situation we're in right now? No, because Nick Nat Nui was back-to-back -back All Australian in 2020 and 2021, and then he missed a lot of last year due to injury. And at that point in time, who is going to delist Nick Nat Nui, especially when you consider the Eagles' lack of ruck depth? We're still in the first year of that contract, and sure, it'd be great if we had the decision-making power to, you know, retire Nick Nat Noff, but it, it really doesn't impact the situation we're currently right in. We've got this awkward situation as well with uh, Jeremy McGovern and Jamie Cripps, who are out of contract at the end of the year. And uh, there was a report earlier this year that they've been offered two-year contracts. And then that story has gone completely dead silent since then. So it's either that the Eagles pulled out because of the fact that Govan Cripps just got injured and were injured a lot last year from memory. Or they did actually end up signing them um, and they've just gone quiet for PR reasons. So let's talk about specifically who I think is probably going to get cut from the Eagles at the end of the year. And like I said, you don't want to clear more than about seven to nine spots on a list in a given year. I think that's best practice because then you start taking seven, eight picks in a given draft. And for most clubs, that's going to be pick 75. And then you have to give them a two-year contract, an 18-year-old at pick 75. There's diminishing returns on clearing your list much further than that. So we'll talk about who I think we should cut. The two most obvious retirements are Shannon Hearn. That's, uh, that would probably happen mid-season, to be honest, if, if we had a better uh, player availability right now. Luke Shuey is probably more likely to retire than stay on. Uh, and then I'd be cutting some dead wood like Greg Clark, Luke Foley, Xavier O'Neill. I'd probably be ditching Alex Witherden as well. Sam petrovsky Seaton is also out of contract. And to be honest, he's shown a little bit, but to be honest, we'd be pretty generous um, extending him for another year, I think. Then there's a couple of players that I'd probably be shifting to the rookie list. Uh, Jack Williams, a Project Ruck, Project Ruck forward, uh, probably more accurately. Got a bit of promise, but been injured most of this year and uh, I'd give him a, another year on the rookie list to try and get his body right and then Luke Edwards as well was a player that unlike you know your Clarks, your Foley's, your O'Neill, I actually think he's got a bit of an AFL future but he hasn't played well enough to really justify another main list spot so I'd be making room on the senior list for a couple of extra picks or rookie upgrades. So essentially what I'm suggesting is Jack Williams and Luke Edwards to the rookie list and then uh, swap them for our two last mid-season draft picks in Jai Cully and Ryan Marrick, give them spots on the senior list. That means out of the out of contract players currently, the players that I'd keep are Jack Petrocelli. I think he's shown enough as a forward in a team that is not getting any supply. I think there's an AFL player in there somewhere. Uh, Jake Waterman obviously is a bit touch and go at the moment. He might have this career ending illness, um, but you know, at, at the moment on face value, he's definitely gonna be offered another contract. And then uh, Jai Cully and Ryan Marrick obviously get um, a couple of extensions each. As for Shui retiring, this one potentially hurts me emotionally a little bit. And I think, you know, he was our best player on the field 
um, on the weekend, and, and he played 17 games last year. He's played probably half the games this year. In isolation, I think he's worth keeping around, but if we need the list space, he's got to make way. But what could happen is that Gaff and Nick Nat are signed for 2024. One idea that I think has potential is that we phase Nick Nat, if he really can't play anymore, into a full-time ruck coach role and still pay him out um, in terms of his contract, which would potentially make another spot on the list. The same goes for Gaff, whether you know we trade him to another club, I don't think anyone would particularly be um, very, very keen on a 2024 version of Andrew Gaff. But if we did, you know, delist and pay him out, I don't know if that's financially possible. That would be another way of making a spot on the list. So if we can phase out Gaff and Nick Nat, I'd probably keep Shui for one more. So let's talk about the uh, the draft now and, and what I'd do in terms of trades uh, to try and regenerate this list with a bit of youth. So we currently hold picks 1, 19, 36, 38, 55, and 57. So that's six spots. The biggest talking point in this space has got to be uh, Harley Reid. Obviously, the Eagles hold pick one, and we've got a potentially generational talent. Uh, probably the strongest ever number one prospect we've ever seen, and um, there's obviously talk about a bidding war. And I'm probably in the camp of wanting to trade the pick to a Victorian club that really wants him, and they can pay us a ludicrous offer because... Frankly, some of the deals being talked about for Harley Reid far exceed what was traded for Chris Judd back in the day. And this is a kid who hasn't, you know, proven himself at AFL level and may or may not just leave West Coast after his first year contract. So who are the best suitors to uh, deal with in terms of a trade for pick one and Harley Reid? So Melbourne is... Uh, reportedly interested. I don't know if it's actually a level of interest or the fact that they've just got some good draft collateral to be able to trade with us. But they hold picks 18, 15, and a future first. And if you bank on Melbourne playing well next year, uh, they're probably going to be uh, another pick around 15. So 8, 15, and 15. To me, that's not really juicy enough to part ways with pick one. I think we can do better. Then there's talk about GWS. They've currently got uh, picks five and eight, I think. And there's talk of Harry Hilmerberg signing a, you know, a big free agency deal with someone and they'll get a first or band one compensation so they could potentially hold picks five, six, and eight. I don't really buy into this one and I'll tell you why because first of all, I'm very skeptical GWS would offer us all of five, six, and eight for pick one. I think that is a ludicrous deal for uh, one single player and I'd be shocked if that is actually on the table. Furthermore, GWS are an interstate side, obviously, with retention issues of their own. So if we're worried about retaining Harley Reid, Maybe not to the same extent, but I'm sure the Giants would be thinking, will this kid want to play for us in two years' time? For me, the most likely suitor for someone of Harley Reid's caliber is probably going to be someone like North Melbourne, and they currently hold picks 2 and 17 in the draft. There's a lot of talk about Ben Mackay potentially uh, signing another free agency deal somewhere else and North receiving band one compensation, which means they'd hold 2, 3, and 17. So this is the deal that I would potentially be trying to get from a West Coast perspective. I don't think we'll be offered 2, 3, and 17, but this is my trade hypothetical. North Melbourne offer us pick 2, 17, and their future first round pick for pick 1 and Harley Reid, and a future third round pick. That way, North trade out of next year's first round. They'll bank on themselves to improve, and we're probably going to bank on them not improving that much. The North would then hold picks one and three in this year's draft. They get Harley Reid, and they get whoever they want at pick three. West Coast would then hold picks two, 17, and 19, and importantly as well, would hold what would be currently be the first two picks in next year's draft. Obviously, if North improve, that might become pick six, seven, or eight. But either way, having two guaranteed top 10 picks, potentially both top five picks, is a great position to be in next year. But I've got a couple of other creative trades that we could use to improve our draft position as well. So we've got 2 and 17 currently. I'd be going to GWS and seeing if they would flip 2 and 17 for their own picks 5 and 8. Now the safe strategy in the draft at the moment is probably to go homegrown because we want to have players that are likely going to want to play for us. And I do think in the top 20, there's 3 or 4 WA prospects that would actually want on the list. So how do we get another top 20 pick? Well, I'd be going to Adelaide who hold 3 picks in the top 24 and not really much after that and offering them this deal. We give them eight as well as picks 36 and 38. So they get an extra couple of second round picks for Adelaide's 11 and 20 and a future third round pick. So that gives us 5, 11, 19, and 20 in this year's draft for top 20 picks. It's conservative in the sense that we're probably going to be targeting you know, more local talents that are more likely going to want to stay than the potential superstar that is Harley Reid. Just on Harley Reid, 
To be honest with you, I'm a little bit skeptical that he is going to be this generational player. We could probably talk about it in depth um, in another video, but I don't think Harley Reid as a player makes sense for us. He's going to take time to come on. And to be honest, he does rely a lot on a big physical advantage he has over some of those other kids. He is going to be a gun. He's going to be a jet. But historically, pick one is rarely the best player in a given draft. And personally, I think getting a multitude of picks in to rebuild the list quicker is probably going to help the club more. So we'd have 5, 11, 19, and 20 in this year's draft four top 20 picks as well as picks 55 and 57 but again next year as well potentially two top five picks and Adelaide's future third round pick as well. So I've thrown together a little bit of a mock draft and this is gonna change so much from here to the end of the year. So I wouldn't pay too much attention, but you know, for pick five, maybe we go the local talent, Dan Curtin. He's currently a, a key position defender who can also play a bit of midfield. And I just think we probably still need a gun key defender on the list anyway. And if he becomes a gun midfielder, all the better. Pick 11, Colton Falstrup. I just feel like this kid's gonna end up at West Coast, to be honest. He's obviously got a relationship with him there, but it's the attributes that I think West Coast will really like about him. He's an aggressive, contested, mercurial style forward. We need forward line potency. We need contested players. We need strong athletes. He's got it all. I'll go out on a limb and say, you know, regardless of what our picks end up at the year, I have a strong feeling we're going to end up with Colton Falster up on our list. At pick 19, the best available West Australian midfielder, Clay Hall, who's uh, having a pretty good chance, and I think his draft stocks will rise. And Ashton Moyer is sliding down draft calculations right now, but I'm a fan, and even though he's got some drawbacks, I think forward line potency is what we need, and if he becomes a very, very good forward at the very least, he'll be worth pick 20. Cohen Livingston is our next generation academy uh, prospect, and it may not end up that he goes pick 55, um, but perhaps we'll match a bid for him. And then David Robertson, whether it comes in the form of trading pick 57, to Brisbane for him or if we pick him up as a listed free agent it doesn't really matter but he brings the benefit of having some AFL potential I'd say he's a good contested player he adds something different to the list and he's also in the right age bracket I've just delisted you know four players around that 22 year old mark and that's what he is so he kind of goes in to support that part of the list transition but anyway guys that was uh, my crack at uh, trying to improve the Eagles uh, in one big trade period and draft period as well and I wouldn't pay too much attention just to the, the players that I've actually picked there because I'm going to change my mind a million times but let me know you know if you're a North fan what do you think of that deal I, I've already put that on big footy and Eagles fans slaughtered me for it I don't think we're getting enough I disagree I actually think North fans are also going to come at me for that being too raw a deal for North Melbourne but I'd be interested in your thoughts again I've mentioned GWS I've mentioned Adelaide in these deals let me know or if you're just a neutral what you think of them it's just a bit of fun not to be taken too seriously um, but I'm already looking forward to this part of the year because this feels like this is where the season begins for West Coast the actual season itself is such a shit write off that trade period and the draft is where we actually come into play this year. But let me know in the comments what you agree with, what you disagree with, and your own thoughts on the Eagles situation, guys. I appreciate you watching the videos. If you could like it, if you enjoyed it, it'd be much appreciated. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.